can we have an umbrella organization that addresses Hindu issues across the board? I will blame, I'm sorry to say this, my biological home state for this significantly. The community in the long run must learn the art of the assume. He is there, he will do it, she is there, she will do it. At the very least, look at it from the perspective of passing on these values to your own children. Forget the rest of the community. There is a difference between secular professions and non-secular professions. Sai, would you like to give a small preface before they have a context to the questions? I think Mr. Ram Prasad has given a fantastic primer or a preface to what to expect and what this entire movement is about. Sir, Way too often I get of asked sir. this one question across the board regardless of where I engage with the audience. Can we have an umbrella organization that addresses Hindu issues across the board? Do we at least follow a hub and spoke method where there is a central organization that supports multiple organizations across the board? because we seem to be having challenges on different fronts. How do we address issues from Tirupati Laddu to Carnatic music? How do we touch upon each of these aspects? When someone asks this question, I certainly respect the angst behind that question and the sentiment behind the question. But the one thing that I've been extremely wary of and extremely cautious about is that the community in the long run must learn the art of self-reliance as well as broad basing of its initiatives as opposed to putting all its eggs in one basket. So increasingly I've been telling a lot of organizers, I've cut down heavily on my public engagements because of my practice commitments and other issues, but the one thing that's going out by way of a standard caveat these days is avoid terms like civilizational warrior, avoid terms like um, uh, whatever superlatives that you feel like bestowing people with. Too early, too premature, you shouldn't be doing it. And second, when you start Cultifying a single individual, it takes away a certain sense of responsibility from others because they assume he is there, he will do it, she is there, she will do it. And in that process, there is a subconscious outsourcing of individual responsibility. And which is why I'm extremely happy about this particular initiative having sprouted on its own having been the product of a rasika and an artist coming together to protect bhakti and dharma. And I think there is a lot to learn from this, the creation of this platform. And I say this as perhaps my unsolicited suggestion or advice, whichever way you see it or whichever way you're interested in taking it. The reason why some of these movements must be driven by the consumer or by the community, broadly speaking, is not from a sense of duty or obligation. I've stopped appealing to Hindus' sense of duty and obligation. I've stopped doing it because I don't see it as yielding too many results. I'm trying to create selfish motives for the Hindus. At the very least, look at it from the perspective of passing on these values to your own children. Forget the rest of the community. If you're interested in understanding, or see, it's like this. To draw from the food example that Mr. Ram Prasad gave, and I think his qualification and, uh, and his training as a behavioral economist was at full display. I don't know how many people paid attention to that, given the kind of examples he gave. On the question of medicines, we want purity, we want quality. When it comes to food, we need to know that what we buy is truly basmati and that it comes from the very same tradition. Organic food has suddenly become a fad when it is something uh, integral to our culture. It's always been integral to our culture. We have come an entire cycle after having destroyed that ecosystem. We are trying to create a patchwork of an ecosystem. It's like trying to cure cancer with a band-aid. Three, we want purity in kanjivaram silk and the tradition. We want purity in dresses, clothes and everything, but not in tradition and music. How does that work? Really, how does that work? 
He is a bit more diplomatic and therefore he doesn't want to take a position as to what is right and what is wrong. Diplomacy is something that is completely lost on me. So I will say that Karnatic Sangeetam without Bhakti and Sanatana Dharma at its base should not be allowed to be called Karnataka Sangeetam under any circumstances. <laughs> now, how does this play itself out? That's the reason you shouldn't give me the mic, because if it starts, it starts. The <laughs> You're a senior educated that. <laughs> so the point is, can you stop the performer from performing? You can't. Free speech, free expression, artistic expression, they are not shields, they have become weapons. They were meant to be shields, now they become weapons. Can you stop an organizer from encouraging that event? You can't. His money, his choice. Who are you to interfere? So how do you incentivize or disincentivize? It is for the audience to not support such events. You hold the ultimate authority when it comes to ensuring that such events do not get the kind of footfall that traditional kacheris are supposed to get. I'm appealing perhaps to the most non-confrontational aspect of the Hindu community, which can still get the job done, because barring certain necessary islands, we don't have the Kshatra Bhavam anymore. Unfortunately so. I don't think it's a matter of pride at all. We shouldn't be proud of it at all. I'm sorry to say it. I'm saying at least be passively Kshatra, which is, if you think a particular artist or a platform is not in sync with your values as a Sanatana Dharmic, such a platform must not get your blessing under any circumstances. That is the essence of the pledge. With this, we can start with the questions. Uh, what are the three vital points that you would like to give to the new generation artists or budding singers? As you know, they will probably think bhakti is you know too far fetched uh, an achievement. So, three quick points. Uh, let's be honest about it. There is nothing fancy about bhakti, right? If you Ile give bhakti a, na romba, uh, gray hair maron, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, pra practically also, thinking. that's that's how things are. Let's face it, for us to come to an entire cycle of learning from what it is in the other side and coming to realize that it is bhakti which is going to be sustainable, it takes that time. And I think we have to encourage that time. But the best that we can do is for young minds to provide a space for them to think that there are alternatives and they are choosing one alternative but at every age at every stage of your development there are alternatives and there are successful alternatives and successful examples for these alternatives right so it is for the youngsters to decide which side they want to align after making a careful thought if they are able to analyze and then pick a side nobody should stop them. nobody should stop them I will go that step. So it's just a question of trying to internalize what are the options available after making a thorough research. If I am able to believe that Yuri Gagarin landed somewhere which I have not seen, I have not known people see him land on anywhere, then if, I, if somebody tells me Tyagaraja actually saw Sri Rama, I have a hard time believing that. If these thoughts are planted on youngsters, then it will be a level playing field. And I think that is our fundamental responsibility as parents. And I'll just do my best to answer that question to the best of my limited abilities on the subject. Uh, approaching that person exclusively from an artistic perspective may not give you a complete picture as to what his leanings are. So for instance, there is one individual who I used to follow who has fallen off the radar thanks to his speeches over the years because of his actions outside the Kacheri Sabha, because of his speeches outside the Kacheri Sabha, because of the pot shots that he has been taking at the icons of this great ecosystem, of this tradition, because of the manner in which he conducts himself. And the reason why this becomes important is there is a difference between secular professions and non-secular professions. Which means, a lawyer may at best be a lawyer in court and not outside of it. But a priest will be judged even outside the temple. Because of the way they conducted themselves as human beings for their adherence to tradition. Which is what added that zinc to their performance on the stage. It's the other way around according to me. So, it's unfortunate that this 
invites us and calls upon us to judge people on their conduct outside of the stage as well. But they've forced us to do this because what used to be taken for granted can no more be taken for granted thanks to what they've done. So unfortunately, this is a reality. So when Sabhas, to answer your practical question, the filter should be, you need to observe their trajectory and their track record, not just as artists, but also what they say about the art when they're off the stage. That's what I would do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, please, please. See, for example, if he sings uh, Tirupavai by saying one raga and th sings Tirupavai, hmm. uh, do you think it is the apt way of approaching things uh, in a correct way? Or is there any other way of uh, singing Tamil uh, songs or whatever be the language songs to reach the people easily? So. Uh, over the years, what I've seen is this is a manufactured barrier. And I will blame, I'm sorry to say this, my biological home state for this significantly, where Telugu songs or songs or kritis in Telugu have been opposed. Songs in Sanskrit have been opposed. Songs in Kannada have been opposed. I have no problems when someone says, when you sing in front of a particular audience, also include a song which relates to that audience's mother tongue without violating the tradition. If you want me to sing a Kriti in Hindi, which is not being composed by Tyagaraja, how am I supposed to do that? That's not going to happen. But if you want a Kriti from, let's say, a dynast of the Travancore family who sung in Hindi in favor of Kashi Vishwanath, I'm happy to do so. Right? Now, there are two aspects to this. One, I think, as a matter of increasing the reach of your art, it is both pragmatic and sensible for you to sing in the language of the home audience. It certainly, I think, is pragmatic. It's good to do that. Two, it takes away the criticism of elitism that Carnatic music is limited only to a couple of languages and not beyond. That it is a Sanskritic patriarchy or whatever they call I have always believed this and I continue to believe this, that across our traditions and art forms, there is what I call a federal structure, which is you have a broad Ganga flowing across the board with different tributaries which express the regional, uh, let's say, expressions. So you have the same sentiment, perhaps captured in different languages. So I don't see any kind of conflict between this performance, but because there is a manufactured conflict which is afoot and which has been going on for over 100 years right now. It has become important to try and cater to as many languages as possible in the interest of preserving the unity and the identity of that art form. Otherwise, just as today we are being told that chants in Sanskrit in temples in Tamil Nadu go against Tamil sentiments, there will come a point where there will be an active opposition even to performance of Telugu Kritis or Kannada Kritis or whatever. In fact, that was one of the movements in the 60s and 70s that happened in Tamil Nadu. It's not something that is new. It has always happened. So I believe diversity in the repertoire of presentation of the artist as part of these Sabhas and Kacheris would be a fantastic message to show that this is an inclusive movement. It is not meant to be super elitist. I would certainly subscribe to that notion. <coughs> Namaste, sir. I'm Krishna Vanshika. My question is that right now, it's not related to Sangeetam, but it is related to Sanata Dharma. Is that the atrocities and attacks that are going right now do fear, do make us afraid of what we can say? I've seen that strong voices are raising, uh, are raising our calls and fighting for us. But the fact that most of us common Hindus are not talking up, the Telugu states of whatever happened in Tirupati, we the students are not even any part of the Hindu families are raising our voices because yeah, yeah, please, yes, please. because we are afraid of it. So what can we do to tackle this and what, what should be our next step? Since 2016, this is precisely the kind of systemic apathy that I've tried to address. And I'm not alone in this. I don't mean by I, I'm, the, I'm someone who is doing this single-handedly. A lot of people have been doing this. I've realized that even if individual Hindus want to react or they want to protest, I've tried to ask why is it that other communities find it easier to get onto the streets? Why is it that it's easier for them to protest either through social media platforms or other channels? 
I've stopped blaming the Hindu community for it. There is a good reason. It's easy to say, oh, Hindus are cowards, they don't have guts, they don't have the spine. It's easy to say that. I haven't seen a single political establishment support your voice or your protest with the same kind of, let's say, unabashedness that they would if the issue related to any other community. And the fact of the matter is, the law will not think twice before visiting a Hindu household, whereas it will think 10 times before going to a non-Hindu household. And no party is an exception to this. So unfortunately, I know what the problem is. Perhaps for the very first time, there are certain voices in the neighboring Telugu speaking state which have come up, which have started making their presence felt, which I'm very happy about. But if Lord Venkatesha does not get this kind of, or does not get support, even from the Telugu speaking states, not that he belongs exclusively to the, the Telugu speaking population, I don't know where else we are supposed to go to. Now what this tells me is, we as Hindus are comfortable going to Tirupati to get our job done individually, but perhaps when it comes to the interest of the community or even the interest of the deity, we end up saying, and I think that's a slightly escapist way of looking at it, oh, he doesn't need our protection, he will protect himself. <laughs> that's our way out of the situation. Now, so there are both sides to it. According to me, this equation has two terminals. One is the terminal from the state establishment, which, where I don't think anybody is an exception anymore. Most of them don't have the guts to represent Hindu causes as I thought they would. And the Hindu community also has to take some bit of responsibility there. But fortunately, there is some ray of hope because people like Dushan Sridhar, Vikram Sampath approached the court quickly, filed a petition. Now, the outcome of the petition doesn't make a difference to me. What matters is, did you make a noise? Did you protest or not? To some extent, it did work. But the rest of the community, I think there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot that was left to be said. So I, let's see, I'm, I'm right now taking a back step because I'm trying to understand what is it that we are not doing right in terms of uh, giving the community the confidence to come forward. If genocidal attacks also don't wake you up, then I don't know what will. <laughs> Yeah, Ramaskarams to everyone. My question is, so how, as a Rasikas, how we can ensure that the next generation Rasikas should not receive unadulterated Carnatic music to their ears? Yes, you should answer. Yes, you should answer. Yeah. <laughs> See, I think that's what they were trying to explain. The point is, the Bhakti component of, please sit, the bhakti component of, of uh, Sangeetam or Karnatak Sangeetam, they can only try and explain the importance of the component as part of the tradition. But bhakti as a standalone component, independent of Sangeetam, is for the parents, not for the gurus. <laughs> you can't outsource that job to these people. Unless and until that basic conditioning exists, it's very difficult for these teachers and these gurus to try and appeal to a site that has never existed in the child from the beginning. So if there is that pre-existing fertile ground, then it becomes possible for that mind to receive content from across the board as long as this component exists. So just as schools cannot give bhakti, even these teachers cannot give bhakti, they can only try and impart that knowledge system with bhakti provided your mind is already attuned to it. So on this, I would swear that that squarely the responsibility of ensuring that they're ready for that particular component would fall on the parents and the families, not outside of it. But the second aspect is, your filtration and your supervision comes in identifying the teachers who you think are going to impart that knowledge tradition with that particular component. <laughs> I'm also going to make a slightly controversial statement. If I have to compromise between bhakti and technical, uh, let's say, quality, what do you think I'll compromise on? on the technical quality of their performance. I don't have a problem with it. If there is suboptimality in the quality of performance, but there is adherence to tradition, I will support such an artist over someone else who's technically superior. <laughs> but let me also say this. The question of technical superiority in this framework is actually, according to me, a trap question or a, according to me, a trick question. 
because the technical superiority of Carnatic music is the bhakti component. Independent of that, you can't be great. Because look at it this way, I can't think of a single divine composition which pushes you into a trance, which is not the product of a meditative or a bhakti-oriented trance of the performer himself. That's how it has come about. At the end of the day, what they are trying to do is to master bhava more than ragam or talam. I think that's more important. So, of course. I must ask all of you to give him an applause for this wonderful coming out of that conundrum. I think it's very, very well answered, uh, Sai. Uh, uh, namaste. I am Mudesh Shankar, served in All India Radio. Uh, thank you, Namaste. namaste. Uh, art needs artist. Mm. Artist needs financial support. Correct. But these days, what is happening? Number of posts in central government or anywhere, they are diminishing and uh, nobody is bothered about it. Mm. When I asked this question at the same most policy maker, mm. he said, you outsource it. Mm. Government is not going to recruit any person. Mm. So I said, when, the, when you are cutting the source, where is the question of resource, right. getting outsourcing? So here my question is that, how can government can shun its responsibility in uh, f uh, no, no, fulfilling these uh, jobs, ICCR, many uh, South Zone culture center, four centers are there, and Akashwan and Doordashan, uh, forgetting about their proactive role, seeing this onslaught of uh, social media, they are not able to even serve essential role. So what is the need of the hour to get more jobs in Karnataka music or musicians? You know, I share your sense of disillusionment. I do. After having spent some time watching this establishment from close quarters and also from one remove, I share your sense of disillusionment. Because you see, the very advantage of coming to power is that the entire state machinery is in your hand. And what is the difference between initiatives like Sangeeta Jnanamu and state initiatives? The multiplier effect and the scale of reach that the state establishment provides, Sangeeta Jnanamu can never do it. Now, their job is to provide the talent the government's job is to provide the megaphone or the microphone so that their voice reaches the rest of the world. They are doing their job by cultivating talent, by keeping a societal consciousness alive. But after having come to power, if your job is to outsource even that singular job that you have to a third party, then what will happen is what has been happening with history textbooks over the last 10 years that the same Marxists and communists continue to dictate the course of your history textbooks over the last 10 years. Because they have decided to outsource the job to others. So on this front, I don't have any solutions to offer because I've been barking up the wrong wall or the wrong tree for the last at least six to seven years, trying to tell them that once you come to power, implement the agenda as quickly as possible, as opposed to thinking after coming to power, ab kya karna hai? Because what the other side does is that they have an agenda. The moment they come to power within a matter of months and days, they start implementing it. So here, you're not asking for implementation of any vicious agenda. You're simply asking for broadcasting of Indian heritage through the best of voices and ambassadors possible by giving them access to, let's say, platforms like All India Radio. You're not alone as far as this question is concerned. Academia, appointments in, in the jobs of professors, assistant professors, across the board, this is the issue. That only leads me to the simple conclusion that culture, art, knowledge are not in the list of priorities because they are seen as non-electoral issues where there is not too much of an electoral benefit. They are useful to showcase in front of a foreign dignitary when you give him a kobarikai and a dandam. But outside of that, you will not do anything about it. So, which is why I keep saying, politics without a policy vision is as useless as staying in the opposition because at least in the opposition you can shout and get the job done. <laughs> what is the point of staying in power when the other side is setting the narrative? That's all I have to say. <laughs> I think the insistence of this platform is not about bhakti alone, 
the insistence is on respect to the original sentiment of the original artist, which is the fount of tradition. Which is to say, if a particular composition has been sung in a particular bhavam, with respect to a particular form of sentiment, it could be either bhakti or it could be erotica, whatever it is, respect it, don't secularize it merely because you are trying to secularize the art. That is where perhaps this position comes from. So this is not to say that everything about Carnatic music must necessarily be immersed only in bhakti. If a particular composition subscribes to a particular form of emotion, be true to it as much as possible. I'll give you a simpler example, perhaps as a practitioner of Kalari Payattu, I'll say this. You start with a vandanam, you end it with a vandanam, you can't do it without that. There is a specific corner of the, of the, of the site which is called the Putara, which is dedicated to Bhagavati, who is the deity for Kalari. There are schools of Kalari Payattu where they have decided to completely remove that particular corner and not have either the, the Vilakku or that particular corner dedicated to the deity. Now obviously in such an art form you are looking at Kshatra Bhava. Now this is therefore not a question of associating it with Bhakti, it's a question of saying there is a specific deity who is associated with it, respect that art form. Now what have teachers started doing? Because they need to respect the sentiments of certain students coming from non-Hindu backgrounds, they have decided to divorce their relationship with the art form and with the deity. And unfortunately, there is no insistence from the parents, the Hindu parents on the teacher to say, we want you to continue to teach it along with the, the devotional tradition or the devotional aspect of it that comes with it. If there was more pressure from the Hindu parents that they will not send their children to such, let's say, what they call the, 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 the schools of, 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 of such martial art forms, then perhaps there would be a greater pressure on the teacher to subscribe to it. Applying the very same logic here, perhaps the, the late motive or the underlying message that's being sent is not just bhakti, which is to say the dharmic roots of Karnataka Sangeetam should not be divorced, regardless of the bhavam or the sentiment or the emotion it represents. Whether it is bhakti or erotica makes no difference.